So welcome to another conversation. So uh, this conversation is going to be something that people have probably been expecting for a while. Um, and it is on the the links between veganism and antinatalism. So I'll do a bit of an intro, but before we do a bit of it, before I do like a bit of an intro to the topic and what we're going to be talking about, um, I wanted to introduce Taiki. Um, so, well, actually, maybe it's just better if you introduce yourself because I could I could say that you know you're vegan, you're antinatalist, you do a YouTube channel, but you'll be able to do like a lot better introduction to yourself. So, um, do you want to? give everyone like a bit of background about whatever you're comfortable sharing like um you know like obviously you're from japan well not obviously to the people watching but like i know you're from japan so like what what is your sort of yeah general sort of life experience up until this point well i've been vegan for two years and a half now i've met anti-natalism probably two years ago i've always questioned about making children without any consent from the children mm. and my best friend in japan who was introduced who, who introduced uh, antinatalism to me that's how i knew the world mm. finally and i read Better Never to Have Been yeah. by David Benatar. Yeah. And I I was I was very convinced. And um, by the idea of antinatalism. Yeah. And um you might have told me this before, but I've actually forgotten like why did your friend originally mention it to you? Did like did did it just come up in conversation somehow or um when I think about it, I don't know how I learned about it from from him natural sure. i think i think he posted about anti-natalism on the socials oh really like twitter or something yeah and i was like oh i've been thinking about it for a long time yeah there's a name for it i didn't know yeah yeah so yeah. that's how i i'm not 100 percent sure how i was introduced and um your your friend that that introduced you to it um are they are they japanese or are they from another part of the world japanese ah because um yeah. the reason i ask is because in japan antinatalism is becoming like i mean by no means is it mainstream or anything like that but it's it's becoming more known and more spoken about yeah. and i sent you some pictures uh yesterday i think you did. um yeah to like very recently i think it was like two days ago or something from when we're recording this, um, yeah. a group called Antinatalism Japan did a demonstration um, somewhere in Japan. I'm not sure exactly where it was, um, holding up placards with... Uh, in Tokyo. Uh, in Tokyo, okay. Holding up yes. um, placards with antinatalist messages and stuff. So uh, to my knowledge, that's the first demonstration of its kind in, in Japan. I mean, may maybe there have been past ones, but... that. To my knowledge, that's the first one. Um, so, yeah, things are things are building there um, slowly, but definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. For so that's antinatalism. What about veganism? Where, where did you first come across veganism? So I was working in an animal clinic before mm. when I was in college. So I was looking after dogs and cats mm. in the animal clinic. When I came home on one day, you know, my parents served me chicken. And at some point, the chicken started to smell like the dogs mm. that I was looking after at the clinic. So it started to kind of freak me out. Yeah, yeah. Eating those chickens. So I started eating, I, I stopped eating chickens. Those types of chickens, fried chickens. But I didn't stop eating other animals mm. at the time. But I was intrigued by the idea of not eating animals, uh, vegetarianism. So I looked up 
the vegetarianism online. And I wanted to try something. I, there's an organization named Humane League.、Mm. Have you heard of Humane League? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of them, yeah. Yeah. So、uh, they were looking for Japanese English translator for the website. So I apl- applied for、mm. it. And I did some work with them. And there is a Japan、uh, branch in Japan, Tokyo. I could connect with a, the manager, the branch manager in Tokyo. And she told me that there was an animal rights march in Tokyo. Oh, nice. It was 2020, January. Yeah. So she recommended I visit it. Although I wasn't vegan,、mm. I was just vegetarian at that time. Because I thought, you know, the veganism is not accepted as accepted as、uh, probably in the UK,、mm. in Japan. So I thought it was not really possible to go vegan in Japan at that time. But after going to the march, and I learned more about the animal factory farms and so on,、mm. and I met vegans and vegetarians and so on. It made it possible for me to go vegan.、Mm. So、uh, on March 2020, I decided to go vegan. Nice. And I also read a book named Eating Animals. Yeah, I've not read that one, but I've、yeah. heard it. It's,、um, what's the guy's name again? Jonathan Safran Fowler. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've not read that one, but、um, I actually. I'm just trying to think, have I read any vegan books? I think I might have read one, which was. Animal Liberation? No, I haven't even read that. I'm like. So, I, I mean, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but basically, I just like. I v e I don't really read that much. I went through a phase about a year ago of reading、yep. quite a lot, but none of the books I read were really vegan books.、Um, one that I have read is called Eat Like You Care. Um, by Gary Francione.、Um, but it's like very、okay. small. It's a very short book.、Um, apart from that, I don't think I've actually, <coughs> I don't think I've actually read any、um, vegan books, to be honest.、Oh. Um, I've consumed a lot of, of like animal rights and vegan、um, philosophy and like literature via audio. So I've listened to a lot of stuff, watched a lot of stuff. But, so, like audiobook? Yeah, but more podcasts.、Um, uh, yeah, podcasts. A lot, yeah, a lot of podcasts.、Um, and yeah, watching a lot of debates and, and stuff like that.、Um, but just not, just not reading. It's just the, the medium of reading. Like, I try to do it, but I just, I'm not too successful at it.、Um, but yeah, either way.、Um, yeah, so that's interesting about、um, how you became、uh, vegan and antinatalist. So, Um, I think, like, before we get into the main subject, I think it would be good for us to like, lay out for anyone that's one. I think the vast majority of people who watch this are going to know anyway, but just to lay out what both are, because there might be a vegan watching this who doesn't really know what antinatalism is, and there might be an antinatalist watching this who doesn't really know what veganism is, right? So, yeah.、Um, Do you want to give a、um, like a brief definition of how you see veganism and antinatalism? And then I'll add anything in that I think should be added. Yeah. So, veganism is a philosophical moral stance, I suppose, to stop or reduce exploitation of animals as much as possible, as practical as possible, according to vegan society.、Mm. Means consuming, stop be consuming meat, dairy, eggs,、uh, other、uh, fashion, like clothing, s like wool, cashmere, and so on.、Uh, animal testing also, not buying products that are tested on animals. And antinatalism 
is a moral stance that procreation is morally wrong. So I think with the vegan one, I'm not sure I would really add anything. The only thing I would like clarify is some people, when they hear you talk about reduce, um, because obviously a lot of people take what's called like an abolitionist stance to animal exploitation. Now, um, I understand the definition that you're giving there. Basically, I think we would both, um, would you call it, uh, endorse like an abolitionist approach to animal exploit, like animal rights. You know, we want to get rid of it, not change how it is. But it's just the nature of reality that animal exploitation will continue in some form because you're not going to be able to convince it's like child molestation for example is always going to continue even if we live in a world where the vast vast majority which we you know do like the vast majority of people see this act as very immoral we have laws against it all of this sort of stuff it still happens though um and so i think basically we want to get to the same point um with animals as we do with with that right so someone it's heavily morally condemned there are laws against it you can prosecute people who do it all this sort of stuff um but no matter how far we get there is still going to be some animal exploitation exactly Um, and the reason why i pointed out reduce is because uh when i create youtube videos about veganism a lot of people mm. anti-vegans say uh there's no way you can uh live without killing any animal at all. Mm-hmm. But that does, doesn't mean, so like, um, if you build a house, right? If you live in a house, there will be some animals, squirrels, or like uh, other terrestrial animals yeah. that were killed when building the house. Yeah. So those anti-vegan arguments point out those things. Yeah. So I always explain like, as much as possible is going to make a difference. Yeah. It's and that that's the that's the actual definition. Yeah. of veganism. So I always tell people about it. Yeah, and I like I see yeah. basically like if I ever think about would is this action okay to do in regards to another animal? I always just think, well, would I do it if there was a vulnerable human in the position of that animal as well? So for example, um like you said, some people say, oh, if you build, you know, if you live in a house, you're responsible for some animal death, exploitation, etc. And so, Mm. you know, you're not vegan. But the same is true with humans. Like if you live in a house, it was built by the construction industry, right? And, and, you know, resources came from the mining industry. These are some of the industries with the highest death rates, right? So it's like humans also died in the production on average of a house. Right. And so, like, is someone then going to say that you're not a supporter of human rights because you live in a house? I, I think they'd probably be laughed out of the room, right? So I think yeah, it's it's like, yeah, it's a useful little tool of like whenever you're thinking about a situation of like, oh, is this okay for animals? Generally, just put a human in their place. And if you think it's not okay, it, I, this might not work with every single thought experiment. But generally, if you put a human in their place and it's it's unethical, then it will be unethical with animals, yeah. and vice versa. If you know, if it if it yeah. seems ethical, it's probably ethical with animals as well. Yeah. Um, cool. So that's veganism with antinatalism. Um, yeah, it's generally it's the view that um, coming into existence is a harm to the to the one being created, um, and then by extension that you know it's morally wrong to do such a thing right yeah yeah so cool there we've laid out like the stall of what the two things are um and the reason i wanted to do this video was because or the reason i think it makes sense to talk about the links between these two things is because there are two very real things um that are that are true right um in the world regarding these two things the first is that there's a big overlap in the communities that hold these two positions so there's a lot of antinatalists who are also vegan and there's a lot of vegans who are also antinatalists and this sort of sub community or whatever you want to call it that sort of spans over both of those two individual ones has even got its own term now um so often it's referred to as veganti natalism um 
So it's I've never heard of it. Yeah, it's it's oh, even got its like me. its own its own oh. term. Um okay. and and some people are beginning to call themselves vegan antinatalists rather than vegan antinatalists or, or whatever. Um so yeah, that that's like a that's a reason I think that it's important to do a video like this to shed a light on, you know, why there are the this big overlap between the two communities. Yeah. Um yeah. and I think the reason for the overlap is because the philosophies themselves Whilst they, and we'll get into this, obviously, whilst some people argue that they don't necessarily directly entail each other, like if you are one, you have to be the other, there are definitely strong links between them. Um, and that's what yeah. we're going to get into today. And maybe some people disagree. Maybe some people will say that, you know, one does entail the other and we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so let's start with... Um, the first one, which I think you, when we were talking about preparing for this, you brought this up about consent. Um, so consent is important to both of these philosophies. Do you want to explain why you see consent as being a, a link between veganism and antinatal antinatalism? So the reason why antinatalism is harm, uh, I mean, procreation is harmful mm -hmm. is because we never received the consent from the uh, unborn baby. Babies don't choose. Baby, babies didn't ask their parents to create them. So that's why some people might end up happy, but some people might end up very suicidal. And they sometimes say, well, I wish I was never been born. I, myself, because I'm autistic mm. and I was bullied. I had a hard time. I have a hard childhood. So at some point, I told my parents, I never asked you to create me. I actually said that to my parents. Mm. It sounds like a horrible thing. I, I know it broke their hearts and I feel bad. But at the same time, it's true that I never asked them to create create me. What's really similar to veganism is uh, some people say, well, if you don't eat animals, the animals won't be created and animals won't live, right? But animals didn't have consent to make them either. They didn't ask those farmers to create them ever. Mm. I don't think they would if they could. So I think that's the crucial similarity between antinatalism and veganism. Lack of consent makes it not moral. Yeah. So and and an additional one on top of that with regards yeah. to consent is that so like you were saying there's the lack of consent for bringing them into existence, which applies to both humans and animals. But there's also the lack of consent with what we do to them once they're here as well. So it's slightly different with humans. Obviously, there is still human slavery in the world and um, has been throughout history. Um, but it seems to be less of a moral issue um, as a proportion of the population now. But with animals, it's very much the norm. Um, so yeah. obviously everything that we do to animals from testing to killing, to just controlling everything about their lives, um, you know, what they, eat, when they, when they, well, I was going to say when they sleep, but I would presume on farms, a lot of them just don't really sleep that much because there's so many of them crowded together, but that's also, um, all done without their consent. Um, and yeah, so I think that's also another sort of important aspect yeah. of um, consent as well. It's not just bringing them into existence, but it's what we do to them um, once they're here. So both philosophies seem to um, put a value on consent. Getting like the having the same act done, one with consent and one without, yeah. it yeah. radically changes the. Um, the nature of the act you know it turns right. consent turns rape into sex work into slavery all of these sorts of things um so yeah clearly to both to both groups um it has 
quite a large um yeah yeah importance um do you have anything else to say on on consent no i think you explained it clearly cool so the next one um and also before we go on one thing i sort of should have said is that so for now uh and this includes the consent point we just talked about i want to talk about the links between the two philosophies um what they share and then later i'm going to bring us on to um considerations that vegans should take into account regarding anti like the an antinatalist may inform them of and the other way around as well like considerations that an antinatalist should take into account that a vegan might you know inform them of um so yeah but for now sticking on the link so the next link is um reducing harm right or not causing harm in the first place so the way i see this is that both veganism and antinatalism seek to reduce harm done to sentient beings or avoid it happening in the first place prevent it from ever happening in the first place so um obviously when it comes to uh antinatalism you know antinatalists uh say that the best way to do that is not even to reduce harm but prevent it from ever happening by just not creating moral aid or moral agents slash patients but i mean the emphasis is on patients obviously um to be harmed in the first place and harm can be cashed out in any ways people want it can be cashed out in suffering or a rights violation or something like that you know however people want to yeah to view that um and vegans obviously want to reduce harm uh by liberating animals um yep. all of this sort of stuff but but also vegans do actually practice a specific form of antinatalism many many vegans are actively antinatalist when it comes to non-human animals because they 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 don't want the the animals to come into existence and 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 have amazing lives that's not what vegans are advocating for vegans are advocating right. for let's just not create them in the first place um as a means of harm prevention and Right. They also work for harm reduction when, you know, animals have been brought yeah. into existence. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that one? Well, just like you said, antinatalism and veganism, they both are about preventing beings from coming into existence uh, to cause zero harm to them. So if one exists there will be a, a hardship. No matter how happy you might be, there will be hardship. Thus, it's harmful to create one. That's antinatalism. And like you said, vegans are advocating antinatalism when it comes to non-human animals. Because we don't think about creating animals, creating animals and making uh, them happy because it's unrealistic and it's it's there's no point in doing it really because mm. i have the same idea even if, uh, if it's the same for non-human animals as long as they exist or uh, if they come into existence more like they will suffer even even yeah cows uh in a open field yeah. they will face some some hardship yeah so i have the same idea when it comes to human animals and non-human animals it's the same yeah 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 the um and the next link that i noted down which i think actually links to both of the previous ones um of um reducing harm but also consent is that um, the the nature of the harms that are uh, being drawn attention to by antinatalism and veganism, the nature of both of these harms are, as I see it, uncompensated. Now, what I mean by that is, um, let's say, uh, 
someone says, um, you know, I want I want to go out this evening, but I've got a uh, you know a dog that I've adopted, and um, to to allow me to go out, I'm gonna you know my friend is going to um, my flatmate is going to look after the dog, you know. Um, now, obviously, in 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 real life, you know, this is an extreme. This isn't an extreme example I'm using. So, um, people, obviously, the average person wouldn't view this as a harm to the flatmate, but it's it's definitely an opportunity cost, right? Like, it, it's a loss. They've lost their time. They could have gone out this evening, you know, all of this sort of stuff. But now they're having to spend, you know, their their evening in. Um, maybe their friends were going out, so they have to spend their evening in now. Um, because you know they're looking after the dog um but you know uh the the person says um well since since you're staying in um i will buy you a meal next week you know so um there there's some sort of compensation for the harm right so yeah. y- you've you've encumbered so- some sort of loss um but it's been compensated because you've also gained something as a, that is directly linked to that loss, right? Um, it's like working, right? Yeah, exactly. You provide your time, workforce. In return, you get money. You're compensated, exactly. Compensated, yeah. Now that I would see that as a as a valid form of compensation, right? Because hmm. um, you you already have a pre existing desire and need for food right and enjoyment and yep. all of this sort of stuff um yep. what i don't think would be a form of valid compensation would be let's say someone says um right i'm going out this evening you look after the the dog um and because you've done that i will buy some heroin and get you hooked up on heroin and 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 give you some free heroin right now this this is not a valid form of compensation because this person had no need or desire for heroin. In fact, it actually makes it it worse. Um, but that's not necessary to go into, even if it doesn't make right. it worse. Like right. they just simply had no need for this heroin, right? Um, yeah. And so it's not a valid form of compensation because it's not um, it's not attending to any pre existing need or desire that they needed satisfying. It's creating. Yeah. A need or desire to then fulfill it which doesn't benefit the person in any way because you simply could have just not created the need or desire in the first place so maybe that's a convoluted example but to bring it back to veganism and antinatalism so the reason that i see this this link between them is that antinatalists are saying um even if someone could be brought into existence um and and someone would say oh well they could have all the good things in life antinatalists mm. don't see this as a valid form of compensation because that individual never existed before to need those good things in life right so you're imposing right. some bad thing on them for a good thing they never needed in the first place so it's not a valid right. form of compensation and it's the same with animals. We bring animals into existence and, and many farmers say, well, we give them food, we give them shelter, we give them medicine, you know, we, we let them roam around in the field, which obviously mostly they don't, that's a lie. But in some cases, they do allow them to roam in the fields. But none of this is a valid form of compensation for bringing them into existence and exploiting them and then killing them in the end. Because the only reason they needed the medication, the shelter, the food is because you created them in the first place. Um, yeah. And so I see this again as a link between veganism and antinatalism. What What are your thoughts on that? One friend who's also antinatalism, vegan, vegan antinatalism, mm. natalist. Uh, we were talking about antinatalism, right, specifically. And he brought up um, the example, the compensation example. You, you, you have... Uh, uh, one a person who's in a prison cell. They will be provided with uh, food and shelter, mm. but they're in a prison cell. 
So would you rather be in a prison cell or would you rather be not like exist? Because even if, you know, the prison guards might say, well, I'm providing them food. But the inmate never asked to be in a prison cell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's really, um, I, I found it really similar to what animals are going through. Yeah. Because they're in a prison cell. Uh, might be a huge prison cell, but they cannot escape. So it's a prison cell, mm. after all. And most of the time, it's a factory farm. So it's a tiny prison cell. Yeah. It's, it's like hell. And those farmers, like you said, they say, oh, I give them a uh, good life. They try to use that as a justification to kill them and raise them and so on, right? So I, I, I see the close link, uh, connection between those things. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and like you said, like um, farmers don't just... Um, they they don't just say oh the harms are compensated but they say this is a you know this is a reason for me to get a personal benefit out of it you know i should be able to make a living off of this because i'm doing something good for these animals which is obviously complete bullshit but it's very yeah. similar to what parents say isn't it you know I get the yeah. fulfillment of having, you know, creating someone, having a mini me, raising them up, having this experience of raising someone in the world because yeah. I'm doing a good thing yeah. by giving them a life. It's very, very much sounds the same. Mm. Um, yeah. Another link between veganism and antinatalism, uh, and I guess me mm, I've got I've got two more links before we go on to the other section I mentioned about, and I think these ones are kind of linked together as well. But maybe not. So the first one is that um, both of them are quite fringe, right? So veganism and anti... Veganism has become more popular. It's more well-known. Most people will know the word, um, although most people don't know the word antinatalist. So veganism was, is more well-known, but they're still both still fringe, right? Even veganism, mm -hmm. in, especially in terms of, of practising it. Um, so I think both of them obviously the ideas themselves are not conscious agents, so they can't do this, but antinatalists and vegans share in the fact that they both hold a, a fringe position um, in society. And I think mm. from that, they can find commonality because it almost doesn't matter what the fringe position is. To some degree it does, but in many ways it doesn't. Just the fact that you hold a fringe position at all will result in certain kinds of social, maybe even legal friction that you can talk to each other about. Even if you may not have the same opinion, you just have, both have a fringe opinion um, and you can help each other uh, find, you know, little tips and tricks or ways to, you know, go about life living by these philosophies um, yeah. to avoid all these um results of them results of them being fringe um i don't know if that made sense i think the reason why they're both fringe is because they require someone to change themselves ah yeah well you've hit on you've hit on the final link which was that they both emphasize personal responsibility and in some form abstinence as well not not sexual abstinence, although some antinatalists do go that far. Um, but obviously, antinatalism, um, antinatalists refrain from or abstain from the act of procreation, and vegans right. abstain from the act of, you know, exploiting animals, purchasing animal products, right. stuff test animals, all this sort of stuff. Right. So yeah, you touched on the last link there. I'm not. So, so I'm not against any. No, so, so like I'm, I'm saying anyway. But if you're like um, standing up for the LGBTQA rights, mm. again, I'm not like saying it's easy. But you can just say, "Oh, I don't discriminate." Mm. 
right? They have the rights. The, if they say it, they're practicing it. But when it comes to veganism, you have to change your lifestyle mm, yeah. to actually support it. So, like you said, I think it requires more responsibility for one's action mm. when it comes to uh, practicing animal rights versus LGBTQA rights. Yeah. Same goes for anti natalism is you abstain from creating uh, children, which a lot of people say it's a human desire to do it. Yeah. So some people have this uh, desire, but they have to refrain from actually practicing the desire. So that's a strong link, I think. And that's the reason why they're both fringe. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I get what you mean. Having to, because there are many... Um, ethical positions someone can take yeah but they don't all um they don't all come with the same level of um practical commitment or however you want to put it right like yeah so i'm not i'm not saying yeah, it's easier to, to practice the lgbtqa rights but you just you, I mean, it's definitely important yeah but you don't have to change your lifestyle you don't have to change yourself you just have to stop discriminating. Yeah, the the stop the average having prejudice. Yeah, like yeah. the the average person, and this this can depend on the situation you're in. Obviously, like different cultures, different countries. But if mm. we use the UK as an example, like the average person is not in, in their daily life going around making uh, gay people's lives harder or discriminating against right. them in some right. way, right? And right. so being in support of the rights of LGBT people, um, it doesn't take uh, any sort of um, personal, uh, there's no personal sacrifice element. Whereas no. with veganism, there is. And with antinatalism, yeah. there is. Although with antinatalism, not in all cases, because obviously some people never wanted kids in the first place. But for many people, they yeah. did. So it would come with a personal sacrifice element and i i agree with you i think that is one of the reasons why they're both so fringe because there's an element of personal sacrifice although you don't have to frame it like that you know i i don't i understand why someone would call veganism a personal sacrifice because you are restricting yourself in terms of some convenience and stuff like this um mm. but it you know it's it's just the thing you have to do if you want to behave yeah. ethically. Um, yeah. And so um, it, it's better to view it as an opportunity rather than a sacrifice. But that's another thing. That's about mindset. Um, yeah. But yeah, I agree with you. I think that's that's one of the reasons why they um, why they sort of are, are still fringe at the moment. Um, before we move on, do you have any other links that you want to highlight, links between the two philosophies, ideas? No, no, we can move on. Okay, cool. So this next bit, like I said before, so I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but basically I've listed down a few things. So um, if imagine, well, you don't have to imagine. I, I, I'm vegan, right? But imagine yeah. I wasn't an antinatalist and an antinat and you come up to me, right? And you say, hey, I'm an antinatalist and you're a vegan. These are some things that I think you should consider given, you know, you're vegan, um, which have been brought to my attention by being antinatalist. Um, and yeah, so anyway, let's just get into them. And yeah, because I think people mm. explain them there, uh, understand them there. So um, when, if a vegan is thinking about reproduction, right? If they're thinking yeah. about antinatalism or natalism and they're thinking about whether to have a child or not, um, one point that I think antinatalism can br bring up for vegans to consider is that when a, when a vegan uh, creates someone, has a kid, right? 
um, there is a chance that that kid will live their life not as a vegan, let alone not advocate for animals, you know. Um, but they'll actively become non-vegan. And maybe they'll even become anti-vegan. Who knows, right? And there are many cases of vegans having kids and the kids not maintaining uh, veganism, right? Both in terms of ethics and in terms of, you know, the everyday practice of lifestyle and stuff, right? A famous example is um, Alex Hershaft, Holocaust survivor turned animal rights activist, vegan animal rights activist. One of his children... Um, is a carnivore dieter and, pr- and promotes it on social media, right? So massive backfire with that one. Um, and obviously, yeah. he's just one example. He's just a prominent example, right? Now, yeah. estimations may vary, but the conservative estimates I've seen is that the average non-vegan results in the death of around one and a half to 2,000 animals, right? Yeah. So what situation would i've like i can't imagine and i've never heard a vegan in any situation say let, let's say there's like a one in ten chance of a child yeah. a vegan having a child and that child becoming non-vegan right it now i don't know if there are actually statistics on this but i would imagine it's higher than a 10 percent chance because we live in a massively carnist world right yeah but let's just say for the sake of argument it's, it's only 10 percent what situation would you ever find a vegan in where they say there's a 10% chance that I will cause the death of like one and a half to 2000 animals? Like, just think about that one and a half to 2000 sentient beings, like tangible sentient beings, you know, like a pig or a cow or a chicken or a fish that suffer in very real ways. Um, I just don't see a situation where a vegan would say, I'm going to roll the dice with a 10% chance that one and a half to 2,000 of them are going to have usually brutal lives and then um, be killed. Um, and what what is the what is on the flip side? What's in that 90%? I mean, in the other 90%, it, it's either the case that they're vegan, where there you've just created another vegan, you, you haven't replaced the meat eater. You've just created an additional person. Um, or maybe there's a, you know, I don't know, if you're raised by vegan parents, maybe there's like a 50% chance that you become a vegan activist. Then you have someone advocating for animals, but who knows if there'll be an effective one or s- something like that, right? And I don't know, I didn't even know if it's 50% chance. I'm just being generous there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, given given that you can turn already existing people into animal rights activists, what what's can you think of any situations where a vegan would take a ten percent chance, which is probably a conservative estimate, for on on is, behalf of? Is there any is there any situation? Yeah, a vegan would. Yeah, like I can't think right. of an equivalent situation where a vegan would consider running the risk of of torturing and killing that many animals. Well, if they had a statistic, let's say seventy uh, percent or eighty percent of children uh, whose parents are vegan turn vegan, vegan activism, they might consider uh, having children. But since I don't know any statistic like that, and I don't think anyone ever did statistics like that, like you said. It's carnistic world. It's a non-vegan world, so it's more likely that they uh, turn non-vegan. I, I I'm not sure. More likely or less likely? I don't know, but there is a chance. Mm. So, like you said, like how? Why would you create a, par- a child hoping that they will go vegan when uh, we can turn existing people? vegan activism because like most i think most people who are vegans now they weren't raised by non-vegan i mean they weren't raised by vegan parents it's actually a rare case to see someone who's vegan yeah. who's raised by vegan parents mm. so i don't see the situation where uh, vegan parents would create children 
and contribute to、uh, more animal cruelty. Mm. Yeah, and the other thing that I think a vegan could consider from an antinatalist perspective is that、um, not only could that backfire and you、um, create a non vegan, when there wasn't a non vegan there, you've just created a new non vegan that's going to be doing all this harm.、Um, there's also an opportunity cost. To creating someone, right? So, if if you want to think about procreation in this way, in a in a for, as a form of activism, right? Because some people do say we need to、um, create more vegans through procreation, you know, to continue the cause of animal rights, and, you know, as basically having kids as a form of activism.、Um, it seems to me like the time, emotional energy. Money and other resources, right, that are put into raising someone until they're eighteen years old or more, which is more, it's common nowadays for offspring, at least in in the West, to be dependent on their parents longer than eighteen years.、Um, putting all that time, emotional energy, money, other resources into that, as opposed to other forms of advocacy,、um, seems like a like mass. Sorry. Like donations, yeah, like donations, or or just using your time to set up an organization or something like that. You know,、um, yeah. seems like a massively inefficient、um, way to further animal rights. I mean, like even if you think of the best case scenario、um, of you have a kid and that kid becomes a vegan activist, like that's eighteen years. And let's say around two hundred thousand pounds, and a, a lot of sleepless nights and emotional energy, all pumped into making one other activist. That just seems like a massive waste of resources and time. When yeah, you, it's like it's、yeah. like rolling around. Exactly. When you could have put it into directly, yeah, you could have put it into much more effective forms of advocacy, right?、Um, yeah. Yeah, what do you think about that one? Well, if they can have the resource, the time, and so on, they can, like you said, set up an organization, or、uh, give donations, give money, yeah, or like talk to、uh, people, and make make them vegan. That effort can convert into more productive, more efficient methods to. Spread veganism. Yeah, like just simply. Yeah, like、um, as just one example, right?、Um, yeah. Take any you know vegan influential vegan person, Gary Yurovsky, Earthling Ed, Joey Carbstrong, you know, other people.、Um, they. Had they have had and continue to have a large influence over many people, didn't do any of it by procreating, but they've created potentially millions of vegans on the part、yeah. of of Gary Yurovsky.、Um, but if you add them all together, definitely millions of vegans.、Um, and of course, not everyone can be a Gary Yurovsky, Earthling Ed, someone like that, right? But If you, because if we think about it, you know, you've got two thousand pounds, eighteen years to play with that would have gone into, you know, raising that kid. You could become much more effective if you use that time and money. You know, spend a couple of years honing a skill, becoming really good at a specific skill, right, and then using that, leveraging that to help animals.、Um, you could do so much good stuff with that, and and you've only used a small slice of the time. That you would have put into raising the child, into honing this skill, then you have the rest of that time and more to then use that skill to benefit, you know, animal rights. Yeah.、Um, so any any way I look at it, it just seems like a massively inefficient way of ad- allocating resources.、Um, did you have、yeah. anything more to say on that? Yeah, just like you said, I think certain skill, on average. 
to become professional at something, I think you have to dedicate 10,000 hours or something. Yeah. Yeah. So you can dedicate that hours into、uh, becoming better at speech or activism or if you're using social media as a way to reach out to people, educate more people,、yeah. and spread veganism. That's, I would say that's a much more efficient way to dedicate your time and money and so on.、Mm. So, those are two things that I thought are considerations vegans should take into account that an antinatalist would probably raise with them. Can you think of any others before I go on to the, the reverse? Like、uh, other examples? Yeah, other, like this one? Yeah, other examples that like vegans. Should think about from an antinatalist perspective.、Oh. Um, yeah, so、uh, I think we talked about this already, but we never know whether our, parent, our children will be vegan.、Mm. Never know. And I believe that's more high, highly likely they become non vegan.、Uh, most likely. Most people around them will be non vegan. And we are a、um, species that are easily influenced by the environment. So,、mm. even if you have a very strong belief, if everyone else has a different belief, you might end up believing that belief. You might end up losing your original belief. So, yeah, just something that you can think about. Yeah, and, and, and a few other considerations as well、um, that an antinatalist may bring up is like people, you know, a vegan may be looking ahead at their life and thinking, oh, I'm going to have a kid, you know, besides all of the traditional benefits of that, it will also help further animal rights. And it, it, it's just a very optimistic way, a rose tinted way, I would say, of looking at it. Because I never hear people take into consideration, like, what if you do that thinking you're going to create a new vegan activist, but you actually create someone who's severely disabled is going to need lifelong care, right? Now, you've, yeah, yeah, you've just, possible. yeah, you've just completely fucked them over by just creating them out、yeah. of nowhere. And now, yeah. now they've just got to endure this life.、Um, yeah. But also, like, you're now going to become a full time carer for, Maybe their entire life.、Um, yeah. So it, it's like, it just seems like such a massive gamble when you don't have to take it and you could just put your time and resources into helping animals in other ways.、Um, yeah. So I thought that's something that people should take into account as well.、Um, just like you say, you're rolling the dice. Yeah. And I think in、uh, David Benatar's book, He described creating children as some kind of Russian roulette. Yeah, Russian roulette, yeah. Yeah. You never know what round、yeah. has the bullet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a gamble. It's a gamble. It's a big gamble. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah.、Um, and the,、um, so the reverse is. What are some things that an antinatalist should take into account that a vegan may present to them? So,、um, the first thing that I thought of is that、um, when, so there are antinatalists who believe different things, right? And I just did a video on this actually about whether animals should be included in antinatalism. And I think the most, the most sensible place to start, and I think this is、uh, an observation a vegan would make to an antinatalist, is that, okay, so you obviously think that bringing humans into the world is a harm to them, right? Creating someone is, is harming them.、Um, what is it about? Them or their existence that is causing that, right? And 
the vast, vast majority of antinatalists would say one word, suffering, right? The capacity to suffer. Um, that, that is the thing that life contains that means that antinatalists don't want to create more of it. Well, then, an, uh, then a vegan could say, oh, well, is it not speciesist to just apply that to humans? Surely, you know, surely we should apply that to animals as well because they also suffer. So surely it's a exactly. harm to animals. Sentient beings. Yeah, exactly. They are sentient beings just like uh, humans. Well, humans are animals, right? So surely um, to be anti-speciesist, which we all should be, like we should all be, you know, opposed to racism, sexism, etc. cetera, um, mm -hmm you would need to accept that animals are also harmed by their existence. So I think that's the first thing a, veg a consideration a vegan would bring up, which very strongly links to the second consideration that a vegan would bring up, which is that if you accept that, which I think every antinatalist should, you then have to accept the fact that a non-vegan lifestyle in the vast majority of cases relies on the systemic and systematic breeding of non-human animals into existence. So mm. not if you're an antinatalist, to me, it makes no sense to not be vegan. Because if if you're a non-vegan antinatalist, you're an antinatalist who literally their lifestyle depends on breeding sentient beings into existence. You seem like a walking contradiction to me. Um do you have any thoughts on that? Well, we don't we shouldn't exclude non-human animals from uh, harmful beings when they're brought up to existence. And uh, you can just look up veganism um, arguments online. Mm. That what's the difference between animals and non-human animals? What, non-human animals and human animals? You would find all those answers. So like why just care about humans suffering and not caring about animals suffering, non-human animals suffering. So that's something that I can say to anti-natalists who, are, who aren't vegan. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and so I th think, sorry, go on. Yeah. So I think the argument that I can make is going to be very similar to what I would yeah, say to non anti nativism as well, just random people without any belief. Similar argument that I can make to them. Mm. Yeah, and um, now I do think that some anti-natalists may say, ah, well, you don't have to be vegan because there are some ways that you can be non-vegan and not rely on the systemic, systematic breeding of um, non-human animals. And they might point to these fringe cases of doing your own hunting. You know, those animals were mm. going to be bred anyway. It's not humans bringing them into existence or eating roadkill. Don't know why anyone would ever do I think if anyone ever advocates for roadkill, it's because they know they've lost the debate basically and they're just trying to appeal to I think so, yeah. scraping a dead body off of a off tarmac yeah. um yeah. but they could bring up the roadkill thing or they could say um you know maybe freeganism style you know i dumpster dive and eat the animal products from from bins and stuff yeah um but the, but the question is would, would they do it well yeah. <laughs> when they say it would they do it <laughs> <laughs> Well, the worrying thing is a lot of people do. Um, but um, what I would say to that is um, whilst that um, whilst that doesn't, it doesn't, like, they're right, right? Like, you can be antinatalist, and if you live in that way, you're, you're not vegan and you're also not relying on the systemic breeding of animals. Um, what I would say, though, is that that is in no way scalable. Um, not... Like if we wanted this stuff to be practiced on a wide scale, so like someone sh presumably would say, um, I'm an antinatalist and therefore I'm opposed to breeding animals into existence, but I'm still going to eat out of bins and go into the woods and try and kill a deer or something, right? Um, 
But presumably the reason they've gone that far to doing that is because they're against the systemic breeding. Right. Um, and whilst they may be logically consistent in terms of they're not demanding new sentient beings be brought into existence, I actually think they're still in an indirect way advocating for such a position. Because if you eat stuff out of bins, I, d I don't think anyone's going around doing the roadkill thing. So we'll just leave roadkill aside. Um, but if you go around eating out of bins and you hunt, right? Um, you're still engaging in the activity of eating non-human animals. And the people around you are also doing that, but they're getting the animal products from a source that systemically, systematically breeds animals into existence. And those people are not going to care about your nuanced ethical position. They're just going to see you eating animal products, you buying into the same sort of culture. And it's going to reinforce their belief that breeding animals into existence is fine. And so I think right. even if someone can try and carve out a niche ethical corner where they say it's fine for antinatalists to do this, I think in the spirit of wider moral progress, they should refrain from doing that. And also, whilst they should, I think in, in that spirit, they should also do that, but it will also, so it will be in the spirit of raising awareness about antinatalism generally, that we shouldn't breed beings into existence, but it will also be in the spirit of encouraging the view that other animals are morally relevant beings who should not be used as resources um which is one of my big issues with something like dumpster diving is that okay you're not directly doing any harm from dumpster diving but you are promoting a system that does do harm and because other people see it exactly because because other people see it uh, and you normalize the fact you normalize the idea that animals are here to be bred into existence and and used as resources right so yeah, do you have anything else to add on onto that? It's about well, what you believe is very important, but how others see is also important. Yeah, is that the point? Yeah, that that's that's one point. But the that promotes right. Yeah, but the wider category yeah. of what we're talking about is things that antinatalists should take into consider into into consideration from a vegan point of view. Oh, other other things. Yeah, if you can think of any. If you uh, can't, it's fine. I talked about speciesism, so and what you said, promotion of beliefs. Mm. They misunderstand yeah. your belief. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by doing something like that. Um. Not that, not at the moment that I can think of. Okay, so let's do a little roundup then um, before we before we finish. So mm. we started by going over why we're even touching on this topic. Right, it's a big overlap in yep. the communities, and the reason for that is because there's a there's a big overlap in the philosophies. Right, there's links between them. Yep. We then started going over the links between between veganism and antinatalism. They both think consent is morally important. They're both focused on reducing and preventing harm. They both, the harms that they seek to prevent and reduce are uncompensated, which, which right. in many people's eyes uh, view, sees them as worse. Um, right. They both are fringe philosophy still, and so the communities can learn things from each other because of that. And they both require some form of personal responsibility or abstinence. Um, and then we talked about things that vegans should take into account that an antinatalist yeah. might raise. And it was the fact that when you create someone new, you're running a risk of creating a non-vegan who will lead to the deaths of potentially thousands of animals on average. Um, and yeah. there's a heavy opportunity cost there in terms of advocacy and then considerations for antinatalists that a vegan may bring up is that um, their understanding of antinatalism shouldn't be speciesist 
and they shouldn't participate economically or in other ways in the system that breeds sentient beings into existence, i.e. animal agriculture, animal testing, all this sort of stuff. Um, so that's an overview of what we've gone over. Um, do you have any sort of closing thoughts at all um, that you'd like to um, say to anyone listening? It can be anything. It can be related to antinatalism or, or veganism or about the philosophies. It can be about the community. It can be about personal decisions. It can be about anything. I think those two philosophies, uh, act of eating animals and procreating, it's all about our desire. Mm. You're not so. So although you say like, oh, when it comes to veganism, unless we create them, they don't live. Unless we eat them, they don't live. You're thinking from your own standpoint. Mm. That's it. Same goes for antinatalism. Procreating, I want my child to ha have a happy life. It's only one way, right? You're not practicing the empathy. Hmm. So I believe when um, talking about veganism to an uh, antinatalism, antinatalist, I can say, well, you're practicing the amazing philosophy. To reduce harmful uh, harm by not creating uh, people, so you're you're ethical, you're moral. Maybe if I point out that first, and then talk about veganism, like this is what we do to animals by eating them, by using them, they might have the realization that. Uh, they're not being moral in one animals so they might have a uh, mental dissonance mm. which might cause them to actually go vegan same goes for vegans you're practicing a uh, amazing philosophy not consuming animals but look at this creation that you're trying to do you are a moral person, you're an ethical person. But when you consider this procreation, when you think about creating someone into existence, you can truly understand that it's not morally correct. So they might also feel the dissonance, which might cause them to become antinatalism. Natalists. Mm. <clears throat> That's what I thought uh, through this live stream. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I um, I just think like both philosophies are um, seeking to make the world a better place, right? Um, and. Veganism and antinatalism, they're both focusing on trying to make the world a better place, but they focus on slightly different um, avenues for doing that. Antinatalism focuses on preventing suffering from ever occurring, from saying, let's not bring new moral patients into the world, because if we do, we are simply imposing harm on them for the sake of a supposed benefit that they never existed to want in the first place. And veganism says there are already many beings here that are being systematically tortured, exploited, killed. And whilst antinatalism is doing the good fight of trying to turn off the tap, there's already some water in the bath. And we need to try and reduce the amount of harm that's happening to those beings who are here already um, by getting people to become vegan divest from the industries that are causing harm to animals, all of these sorts of things, right? So yeah. I think they both come from the same place of wanting to make the world a better place. Um, yeah. 
one by there being less the, beings the in it as possible yeah one by there being less beings in it but also the beings that are brought into it they have a better life yeah. um so yeah i think if there's a vegan listening to this who isn't an anti-natalist hopefully we've shed some light on to some considerations they may want to think about and if anti-natalist is listening to this who isn't vegan hopefully we've brought up some points that they can take on board and um hopefully both parties can adopt the other position and and become vegan anti-natalists but um hmm. we'll see we will see if anyone yeah. anyone does that from watching this video um i hope so where can people uh, keep up to date with your stuff, Taiki, if they've listened to this and they think, oh, this is a cool guy. I want to hear some more of you know, what he has to say. Um, where can they find you? On YouTube. If you look up Psy Taiki, P-S-Y as in psychology. Yeah. And Taiki, T-A-I-K-I. That's where my channel is. I talk about veganism and sometimes anti-natalism. And I think the latest video on anti-natalism was my reaction video to uh, Unnatural Vegan talking about anti-natalism. Right, yeah. Because she's vegan, but she's not. She, she She's really advocating creating children. Yeah. So, yeah. There are some points that didn't make sense. So I reacted. So if you're interested in anti-natalism content, and I occasionally make some. Mainly I talk about veganism, and there's a new video coming up that I'm reacting to. A, uh, I think he's pescatarian, Japanese, mm. uh, who's, who's against veganism, though. He doesn't eat chickens, but he's against veganism. Mm. So, yeah. And it's coming up and uh, English subtitles will be available end of the month. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, people should know your channel is in English and Japanese. Um, yes. I th this one's going to be Japanese because yeah. the original video is, was in Japanese. But I yeah. will put subtitles in English. So No, I, 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 think, I think it's good. You know, there are, there are a lot of people making vegan-related content in English. Um, yeah. And my understanding is that in Japan, a lot of people don't speak English, right? So no. they can't necessarily find the content about veganism that's in English. Right. So the more right. people making vegan content in Japanese, the better. Because um, it, it's like a, maybe it's not an untapped market, but I'm sure it's not as saturated as, as the English uh, market for, yeah, um, for vegan content. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you're doing great stuff by making vegan content and some anti-natalist content in, in Japanese. Um, yeah, I think we've covered everything. I will put all your links in the description and stuff so people can find your channel and all of that. Um, but thanks so much Thank for coming on and doing this video with me. Thank you for reaching out to me.